Hi, I'm Michael Darvin, feeling rather strange to be sitting in a velvet chair in an open space at the National Opera House in Wexford. When I'm here, I'm used to having the festival's excited opening night buzz all around me. Today, I'm hemmed in because of COVID-19, but I'm here for an impossible interview with Maestro Antonio Papano. Hi, Tony. Hello, Michael. You've been music director of the Royal Opera House in London for nearly 20 years and music director of the Orchestra dell'Accademia Nazionale di Santa Cecilia for 15. But of course, like the young artists in the Wexford factory, Wexford Festival Opera's new professional development programme, you had to begin somewhere. So I hunted down reviews of your younger self from the 1980s. I found a mention of your lively piano accompaniment in Puccini's songs in the New York Times in July 1983 and in August 1988 Opera magazine reviewed a Norwegian opera production of La Boheme and said Antonio Papano is an excellent Puccini interpreter and secured one of the best performances I have heard for a long time. Just the sort of coverage anyone would envy in the early days of a career. Um, <laughs> But back to 2020, um, where were you and what were you working on when the COVID-19 lockdown hit you? Well, the night before it hit, I was conducting the London Symphony Orchestra in a programme of British music. Uh, Vaughan Williams' Talis Fantasia, the violin concerto of Benjamin Britten with the extraordinary soloist Wilde Frang and importantly the, uh, the Vaughan Williams sixth symphony which is a hammer of a piece and it's uh, it's quite aggressive and quite an, an angry piece but it ends in a very very strange way it, it, it almost post Apocalyptic uh, is the best way to say it. It is so stark and so disturbing and so soft and tense and eerily beautiful but, but almost hopeless um, that I tell you, almost everyone from the orchestra came to me after the concert and said they felt something big was going on or was coming. They knew it, and that they had, they had to play for their lives. It was very, a very interesting and not so pleasant, I would say, experience, but an important one, just from a spiritual and human point of view, a culmination of everyone's inner feelings. It was because we knew we were going to go through something that was going to change our lives. And in fact, that's what's happened. So that's what I was doing. I was also conducting Fidelio at the same time. But, um, and the final performance, which was to happen on the day after lockdown, um, was the one that was going to go into cinemas, that's going to be shared with people all over the world. So it was a very, very unfortunate, but understandable um, situation. Uh, uh, here's a piece about liberty and freedom and perseverance and the human spirit and and you know it all came crashing down around us. And when when you were in the lockdown, were you one of the really active people, you know, tidying, planning, or were you one of the people who? Um, it, just found it vaguely oppressive and weren't able to do all the normal things. Well, let me tell you, in the first couple of weeks, it was ve I found it very disconcerting because I was kept incredibly active because all of a sudden um, I needed to 
finish the edit of that recording. I needed to look at the video recording of this that the BBC wanted presto. Um, of that that needed to go to the editor right away. And so I was working at the same time on, I think, on the, um, uh, on the final edit of the Sony Otello recording, which has since been released. Um, Macbeth for the BBC, which was uh, with Anna Netrebko, which had gone into cinemas a couple of years back, but they wanted to present it, so we had to just look at it again to make sure it was okay. And Fidelio, and in two guises, one, one for the uh, Japanese uh, NHK, the, 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 the BBC equivalent in Japan, mm -hmm. who filmed the earlier performances, and the BBC itself that filmed later performances. So I was listening to myself, um, which I don't particularly like to do, I have to be honest with you, um, especially when I have to overdose on it. And uh, so I was extremely busy, and of course it made me extremely nervous at first. When I wrapped those things up, I, I took a breath and I finally realized that, hey, wait a minute, um, you know, what are you going to do here? You know, are, are you, we're gonna, you're gonna worry because you have two organizations to worry about, the Royal Opera House and Santa Cecilia, of course, that is normal. But you also have an opportunity to stop and breathe and think and take the brakes off the career. Which, let me tell you, if you're in any way successful or you have big responsibilities, the motor, the engine of this uh, career or this phenomenon of leadership, if you like, is, well, it's like a railway train. It's like a locomotive. And, and sometimes not in a good way. It's, it, it's, it's implacable and unstoppable. And sometimes I think it's okay to stop this locomotive. And here it's been forced upon me and in a much deeper and more significant way than I would have ever have imagined. Um, it, it, my body has felt completely different because I'm used to conducting at least six hours a day. When you stop that, you're a different human being. You're, you're, you know, that's a Tony Papano that I don't recognize. And, and so I've, let, I've started to get to know my body better a little bit, you know, and certainly my, um, my brain and my mind and my thoughts have had a chance to, you know, take this breath that I was talking about, which has made me consider things. Now, this is all happening after I just turned 60, uh, the 30th of December, and, and maybe the two have nothing to do with each other, or maybe they have everything to do with each other, and that you start to think, oh, wait a minute, I've been living my life this way, and I've been very fortunate, I've been I'm involved with two institutions uh, that are basically my families. Um, I've worked with any number of great soloists, singers, stage directors, and uh, and just the teams at both places are just superlative, so that which have enriched my life. But um, you start to say, well, wait a minute, what is necessary now in life? What do I really want? What do I want to achieve? What pieces mean something to me? What um, what what is going to be the way forward? I I can't tell you that I have an answer. But I can uh, yet, but I do have a um, uh, an an inkling as to as to when to say no more courageously, um, and and to be absolutely convinced, uh, you know, when a no is the right thing to do, and. Um, 
The other thing that's happened to me is I've started to play the piano much more, which for somebody like me, who, who originates f from the piano, it's been a, a gathering of my, of my thoughts and my feelings and, and auto-discipline, you know? I mean, when you have to play the notes yourself, my God, you know, so I, 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 I came back to the Italian concerto of Bach, which all pianists play when they're younger, and, you know, tried to really get it up to snuff, you know, and play it properly. And uh, the chromatic fantasy and fugue, which I grew up playing, um, son Mozart sonatas, but also I'm learning the, um, the Rachmaninoff cello sonata, the, the piano part, mind you, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is very difficult, and I'm playing next week. So that's been a, a project. But I've, I've been communing with myself, which has been a very, very good thing. I've also uh, been learning two big new pieces, both of which got cancelled during the lockdown. Okay. One of them was Mahler's Seven, and the other one was uh, Don Quixote of Strauss. I was supposed to be doing in the next few weeks and they but I really put in the time so I'm proud of myself but I've had to you know give them a little bit of a rest so it's been a, a very rich and rewarding um, time which has involved eating and drinking and watching television uh, with my wife Pam and we've that's been very very good for us uh, not so good for my figure <laughs> And what should you have been working on now, six months later, after the, we're into the lockdown? Well, um, there were innumerable... Um, uh, no, wait a minute, let me, let me think. I've, I've, <laughs> I've almost forgotten what was supposed to happen. Um, usually at the beginnings of season... Oh, uh, yes, of course. Um, the reason I can't remember is because this was supposed to be a sabbatical year from Covent Garden. I was not supposed to be at Covent Garden at all um, uh, for complicated reasons, but uh, because I'm coming back in a year's time uh, to extend my tenure a little bit. And so I was... Working, I was supposed to be working elsewhere on tour with my Santa Cecilia Orchestra a lot. Uh, most of that was cancelled. There are still some tours coming up. We're still waiting with bated breath. Um, I'm making recordings. I'm uh, playing the piano some, some recitals. Mm -hmm. And I'm supposed to be in, uh, in January, I'm supposed to be conducting the Covent Garden production of uh, Szymanowski's King Roger. Uh, at La Scala and who knows I mean La Scala is not making very loud noises at the moment for obvious reasons um, and, and so I'm a little bit concerned about that and so uh, originally in November, December my wife and I were going to take a big uh, uh, holiday uh, going to Patagonia and um, and going to Antarctica and all that. And I've never taken six weeks off during the season, ever. So it was a very, very big deal and we'd planned it for about five years. And that's all been cancelled um, because we don't want to go on a cruise wearing a mask, you know, I mean, uh, 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 I mean, uh, um, and, and so, and so there's a lot, of, a lot to deal with, a, a very, very new, a very, very new horizon in front of us. Um, we had big, huge question marks, I have to say, personally, privately, therefore, but also professionally. How, are, how is Covent Garden going to get back on its feet, really, and to, if we don't have a vaccine? How is Santa Cecilia going to really get back on its feet? I mean, I did a concert last night for a thousand people. It was supposed to be outdoors. We ended up doing it indoors because of rain. It worked. It was very well organized. Everybody wore masks in the audience. It was incredible. But, you know, we, the opening of the season, which is in October, it has a big question mark around it. We've, we've totally rethought the uh, repertoire, smaller 
uh, smaller repertoire, um, uh, shorter programs, inventive programs, I think. But, you know, we don't have the guarantee that... Uh, we don't have the guarantee that the audience will come over three concerts. We, we hope. You know, so there's some big question marks and, and obviously financially we're going to take some real hits. We've already taken enormous hits. Mm -hmm. Will we be able to survive this? I mean, these are really existential questions that we're dealing with at the moment. And look, when you have a challenge like this, the, the, you have to be a totally unified in your as a team and you have to be creative agile nimble mm -hmm. and i you know the problem is of course there's going there's going to be some sacrifices um that have to be made that's the question i sorry i was going to say that the sort of transformation and destruction which you're, we're experiencing at the moment is always inevitable in some shape or way and what do you think operatically speaking is the most important for us to try and preserve from destruction as we negotiate the difficulties because companies will be changed careers will be changed there will presumably be people who will um, end up doing other work yes I don't think we can save everybody but I think from my experiences uh, with live audiences here in Italy and the streamed audiences um, through my activities with the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, I do believe there's an incredible hunger out there for what it is we have to offer. And people have missed it and we have to make work. We Now, I want to do live work. Uh, it, streaming is all very well and it's all very modern and it's necessary. But for me, it's very much a, a, a tool for transition. Not to be thrown away once we get back to normal, not at all. Mm -hmm. It's an enhancement. It's something that that is, is something where that we use as we do with cinema to to get a bigger audience um, we have to convince the governments that we are very very aware of the protocols that are in place at the moment and that we can manage those protocols um, you know <clears throat> it's very difficult for, for somebody like me to be in a plane that is crammed full of people um, or to be in a pub that's crammed full of people or in a restaurant and uh, and then in a theatre like ours at Covent Garden which has a state of the art ventilation system and already plans in place to how to um, distance audience members and people who are performing how, you know, what, why can't we, you know be left to our own devices to be creative and to see how we can make the best of a difficult situation. We've been given a little bit of a go-ahead, but I think, I, I think that somehow we're being held up of examples of cautionary uh, policy. And this I, I, I take issue with. Is there any level at which you see there might be positive transformations for the world of opera coming out of the current difficulties? Well, obviously, the, the, the hunger for all of audience is one of them, perhaps. Well, yes, I think that the audience will see that the resilience of the organisation, I, I can only speak for my organisation now, but I do hope it would be true for all musical organisations, that, that the organisation is seen to be resilient, um, seen to be taking initiative, seen to be creative, and that when we get the go-ahead, uh, or even before we get the go-ahead to, to get back to normal, we are doing stuff. Um, this 
then presupposes that we keep this audience, that we don't lose the audience uh, because of this hiatus. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that through the streaming and through our little clips of, uh, that we do on uh, ROH Facebook and, and, and the educational clips, ballet, opera, you name it, um, that these are feeding our audience. This is the whole point. Um, I think but artists need to be able to express themselves. Um, art is... Uh, uh, Theatre and opera and ballet is a mode of expression that, and I'm not saying anything new here, that enriches our lifestyles, that is especially important now when we need uh, moral, psychological and spiritual nourishing after what for many has been an incredibly difficult and lonely period. Um, in terms of the young people um, that are beginning their careers in, in opera or in music in general or in theatre, they need to keep studying, honing, trying to um, not lose hope because, because the answers are around the corner and we, we, we're just preparing to receive them. Um, of course, not everybody can be resilient and not everybody can survive this long hiatus financially, morally, spiritually, uh, in any shape, manner or form. It doesn't mean that people can't come back uh, to music. There's just going to be a very, very difficult period ahead. Um, but uh, we're in this same boat uh, everybody's in the same boat, so um, I think if the organizations are tight within themselves, um, that we'll be able to um, get through this. I, 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 I really believe this. Um, there has to be goodwill and there has to be generosity, there has to be understanding, and there has to be the continued motivation to want to... Um, to make music and to share uh, this expression. So uh, speaking of uh, transformations and looking at it on a personal level, before COVID-19, what was the most unexpected transformation of your own personal career in opera? Well, I think anybody's career is linked to your collaborations, I think. And the collaborations that I've had with great stage directors, that with the combination of great stage directors and great singers, uh, and or great orchestras, um, has been, for me, transformational. I've been very, very lucky to be able to record also in the studio to um, I've had the opportunity to do television work. I've had the opportunity to do radio work. I've, you know, um, I've had a, a, a form of um, a communication open to me that has allowed me to sort of share what it is I believe in, to share my passion, my knowledge, my experience. Um, that has been, that has made me in a sense, of course. Is, is there any transformation that you are still longing for or hankering after? Well, <clears throat> I think I'm, the nirvana is to, you know, and you hit it every now and, now and again, is to get that right pitch a production, a visual production, in other words, the work of a stage director and his designer, together with the right cast and the right orchestra and the right conductor, you know, and you, all the elements working really together, you know, to create something very, very special. Um, it happens, and... Uh, you know, and, uh, and 
you know, I wish it would happen all the time, you know, that, that there's this, this magical, uh, you know, every new production is a magical combination of artists and, and, and vision. And, uh, you know, but that's, if you're in the opera business, that's, that's the job, is, is to try to achieve that. And, and so that's my goal. I would say, um, um, I would say that if, if in, in terms of what will be transformed in today's world, that, I mean, I, and I mean today, um, mm. as a transition, well, let's, let's see. I mean, um, Covent Garden is going to try out something, some, a, a new um, form of, of staged entertainment which is going to be announced very soon so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, go into detail there um, it's something of course that will you know is distanced and has all the protocols and all that stuff uh, but is I think very creative so going forward we're gonna have to reinvent the wheel here um, you mentioned magic Let's imagine there's a genius who's been out of work and locked down since last spring and who's managed to invent a time machine. Where in operatic history would you like to travel? Oh. Well, I think... Uh, <laughs> that's a very difficult question because I have two... I have two extremes. You know, I, I would love you know, to have been at the premieres of La Traviata, so in the 1850s, La Traviata, Rigoletto and Trovatore, to find out exactly if the operas were performed uncut and with every note sung and with all, you know, everything as written, come scritto, and, uh, and just to get a flavour of what that actually was, to see... Um, and then there was, you can't, I think, as a musician of today, you cannot have been, you cannot be not fascinated by um, the period between 1905 and 1924, shall we say, um, where so much was going on in every country, in Italy, in Austria, in Germany, uh, in Poland, in... Um, you know, just really, really everywhere was just creating work um, that, that, that was so innovative. And even if there was cross-referencing cross or cross-pollination is a better way of saying it, it was so extraordinary. And any composer you'd particularly like to meet? It's funny, uh, when Daniel Barenboim was asked this question, uh, with whom would he like to sit down, what, which composer he, would he like to sit down and converse about music? And he, he didn't hesitate for a second. He said, Franz Liszt. Uh, because somebody who straddled somehow two incredible periods, you know, the classic and the romantic, and and, you know, bringing... Beethoven with him, you know, through Czerny and and then everything that came after him and Wagner and, and all that. I, of course, um, I'm fascinated by the Italians, of course, um, by, by Verdi and Puccini, partly because, especially in the case of Verdi, he was straight-jacketed for a long time. Uh, in, in the form of the bel canto opera or the op opera tradizionale as we you know as we know it and and i would like to discuss with him what what were the pros and cons of that um, i mean i have my own clear ideas about that but i would like you know to know from him uh, if that stimulated creativity or it was just um expedient to write as quickly as possible you know, th those kinds of things. And, uh, I mean, he did abandon that way of writing later on. Puccini, of course, because of all the stimulants that he was able to somehow include in his music but not 
sound like a copycat. I mean, from Debussy to Stravinsky to Strauss to Wagner, obviously. Um, and yet the music is, is somehow very much his own. It's, it's an, so I'm fascinated to, to you know, to, to, to prod, <laughs> if you like. Any singer you'd want to hear? Oh, well, I never heard Corelli live, Franco Corelli, the great tenor. And I've heard the recordings, my God, you know. Um, I, I'm not sure if, as a conductor, I'd probably have a heart attack because I, I get the feeling that he was not the easiest person to conduct. I might be wrong there, but I don't think so. But just the thrill of that voice, the size and, and the effect that it had on the audience, what that must have been like. Uh, we, had, we don't have much of that today. We really don't. And is there any particular first night apart from those... Verdi nights that you mentioned? Well, listen, I have to say that every first night of a new opera is, you know, in a certain sense for us, the great white hope, you know. I mean, we're all waiting for the opera that becomes the opera that everybody will perform, be performing over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And, and so I think it's very every premiere of an opera, uh, you know, so let's go forward instead of going backwards. Okay, and last question for this impossible interview. If you received an invitation from Wexford Festival and they allowed you to choose the opera, what work would it be and why, in terms of their ethos of rare and forgotten pieces? Ooh, that's a difficult one because I would probably have to uh, get the advice of Rosetta Kuki. She knows these pieces much better than I do. Um, an opera that I really, really have a soft spot for is um, L'Amore dei Tre Re of Italo Montemezzi. And it's funny because I was listening to a recording this morning um, with, uh, with the composer conducting an incredible cast with uh, Grace Moore and, um, and Ezio Pinza and others. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a it's it's a hybrid. It's 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 a kind of a, a verismo, Frenchified, very perfumed, very melodramatic kind of concoction that I have. I personally have a weakness for. I just do. <laughs> you, you're probably now disqualified because I think they did that back. Okay. Okay. Yes, back another years. piece I can say is um, is. Uh, is the piece by uh, Paul Ducat, the Ariane Barbe Bleu, which is not really an opera, and the part of Barbe Bleu is just a few lines, but it has an incredible orchestra part and an amazing uh, soprano role or, or high mezzo role. I'm sure Wexford has done that too. Tony Papano, it's been wonderful to do this impossible interview with you for Wexford Festival Opera. Here's hoping we and everybody else can get to see each other in the flesh again sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you all the very best of luck. Thank you very much.